Well, I am a little bit flattered, if I may say it or formulate it in that way. LiveRock62, thank you for your request regarding how I care for my flipper orchids. I have only one frag here on the right, which is the Fragmopedium Garen Weaver. But I brought out some other examples that I want to share with you because they're kind of different with everything else that I have. I don't have much experience growing slipper orchids, especially now, um, let me just say for the last two years, I've tried to see how they would do for me in my climate and also in LECA because all I've ever seen is them growing in organic media. So for me, it was just a test and say, look, this is how I want to grow my orchids. Let me get a, a few, starting with the American hybrid. I believe that this is it. I, it's never bloomed for me because I got it off the rescue table and what a sorry state it was in. But having said that, I wanted to say, okay, I will have my setup. This is the media I want to grow in and I'm gonna then expand on a few more if I can see how one is doing. Now, this is not to say that they're all gonna do well in this setup, or you may have to adapt a little bit simply because there's different structures and different way the leaves are set up and especially the apex. But let me just talk about what I do and maybe there is something in there that is helpful and can be of use to you in your collection and anybody else that's watching. So thank you very much for clicking on this video. I really appreciate it. Again, Slipper Orchids and I have a history of two years. So what I'm gonna share is what I've been doing in the past two years, as well as what I've done wrong. I'm starting with the American Hybrid because that was what was in your question. And again, assuming this is it, but I'm 90% sure it is. I have found with my American Hybrid, it has a lot more tolerance of light than I gave it credit for to begin with. Its light levels are extremely high. And I know that, and I've noticed that because when I forgot the angle of the sun that it, where it lives and the angle of the sun was hitting it and I only realized afterwards, I would touch the leaves with the sun still on it and the leaves were cool. And when the leaves are cool, that means that they are actually not taking on board that heat and are able to tolerate that light. And the leaves never burnt. They were, if I had put a fowl as a contrast, if I had put a fowl in a similar situation, I'm sure I would have got some blemish on the fowl leaf, maybe not have singed it completely, but the leaf would have heated up. The American hybrid, the leaves got a little bit warm, but not heated up. It, it, was, it was really strange because the amount of sun for the time of day and how long it was on the leaves, it should have been quite hot in comparison, for example, to a fowl. And it didn't happen with this one. So I left it um, again. It was a rescue and I'm like, I need to understand these slipper orchids and get a better feel for them in order to know what's good, what's not. The leaves never burnt. Eventually, I did, you know, push them back a little further, depending on the time of year. If the angle of the sun in September, October was hitting the orchid, then I would pull her back a little bit so that she's in super bright shade, but the sun is not directly hitting the leaves. Now, we're in mid-November, December, January, these months, if the angle of the sun hits the leaves, I don't mind so much because it's not that hot sun and the temperatures are way, way down as opposed to September and in some cases, October. In conclusion to all that, they take a lot more light and sun than we can give them credit for. And in, with that respect, I'm thinking that is why mine is blooming now. And it's two years in my collection and it came with two mature fans and these growths, this one, this one, and this one, they were little tiny shoots coming out of the side. They were even smaller than the new one back here. So I knew that I had some potential in the pot and eventually the main fan that had bloomed had dried out and I actually took off the yellowing leaves. I've never unpotted this orchid. 
and I'm not going to do it now of course because it's in bud and spike and I don't want to mess that up but I know that she was pot bound within three not even three months this orchid was pot bound in the semi-hydro setup across the board and we'll go on to talk about the other ones here that are a little bit smaller and I'll speak about my frag as well because look at the sorry state of that it's getting better believe it or not but yeah it's not my finest example and my only frag clearly because I'm still learning about it but across the board I flush during the colder months of the year once a week because I have a deposit on the bottom it's not like the media dries out at any time at all so once a week I flush then on that same flush day I put in a fertilizer solution into the reservoir and that includes the frag which is in 100% semi-hydro this is not an outer mask this is 100% semi-hydro so I do the flush and then across the board of all my paths it's like my path or slipper day I put in the solution of fertilizer into the reservoir at my fertilizer strength will always be 300 ppm I don't differentiate between who needs what and how much or am I going to do something wrong because if I do something wrong the orchid will tell me and then I just won't fertilize but once a week after the flush the fertilizer goes into the reservoir the next day I take that fertilizer out empty the reservoir and then I flush through with clear RO water again sometimes it has seaweed in it sometimes it doesn't so maybe once a month at a minimum the reservoir will have seaweed for a week and then I leave them for a week like that in these colder months with a fresh reservoir and I do it again the following week so it's like an overnight stint of fertilizer but I remove that then the following day my slipper orchids actually get quite a lot of attention because it's like a two-day process you know when I flush other orchids they just get flushed through and then the fertilizer goes into the deposit and then that's it until they absorb the fertilizer these guys I flush one day put the fertilizer in wait next day empty the reservoir out and flush again so you see that I don't actually have that many slipper orchids because if I get really busy um, ain't nobody got time for that <laughs> but for me in this case with the American hybrid it needs a lot more light I believe than normally one would assume for paths and I think that is why it's blooming again it is also a candidate that hasn't gotten to the point of lifting itself out of the pot which I really like but I have to be very careful of roots that are trying to crawl out of the surface you can see that so now I have a microfiber over the top because that works wonders to keep the root out of the light as well as wet, humid between flushes. And I spray that microfiber. So that's what happens with paths in my collection in the Lekka because look at this one. This is my Lindy Kupowitz and I want to show you I'm just going to say it one more time and maybe I'm repeating myself afterwards, but I have not repotted. Hmm, hang on a second. With the exception of one I'll show you now and the Garen Weaver here on the right, I have not repotted any of these slipper orchids. But let me address the roots again because this, this one, the Lindley Kupowitz, climbs out of the pot as the roots take over the pot. And I also have a microfiber here you can see that it's it's there because a root was starting to come out at the top you see that there not good so I'm looking for the right size pot for this because it needs to be repotted and get down lower in the pot hence the microfiber to protect that those roots that are coming out at the surface from light and from getting dried out. It is even on an old fan, so I don't care. The old fan that has bloomed has still looks fabulous, and I want to make sure that root is taken care of. And it's, it's doing well. 
it's surviving in that method. Again, this one, same treatment as everybody on path day. It's flush, fertilize, next day, empty reservoir, flush and fill up with RO water in my case, and then leave it in the winter for one week. And then in the summer, it, that happens almost twice a week, but I will only ever fertilize once a week. So I can see there's absolutely no damage, fertilizer burn or anything on these leaves. That means these two orchids can take the once a week fertilizer regime. And that's what I'm looking for because my Phragmopedium, not so much. This is an old leaf that's dying back from a fan that bloomed earlier in the season. And I keep trying to yank it every day and it's not coming off easily, so I just leave it. But here's fertilizer burn, because I thought when I got this orchid, yippee I'm in a warmer climate, it's going to grow faster, it needs fertilizer, but nope. You see all my leaf tips are brown. So that is fertilizer burn. And then I have some pitting, which I thought was bugs, but they're not. That is something else, and I believe also that has to do with too much fertilizer. So I have not fertilized this orchid in over a year. Maybe I gave it some fertilizer a week ago. I don't even remember. But let's just say for the majority of the year, I have not touched it. Yeah, I must have given it some a week ago because it was raining so hard that I poured some fertilized water into the reservoir and let the rain flush it out. Yeah, must have been something like that. But it is, um, it is not an orchid that likes a lot of fertilizer. And now the new leaves were grow growing clean, but now they have some yellowing on them. So there is some kind of a deficiency here. So please, you know, don't take my care as the one all kind of care on paths and semi-hydro, frags, sorry, frags, because I am definitely not getting it right with this frag just yet. Thank goodness it's so forgiving. And this one lives outside year round. Everybody else, all my others, have a very steady temperature. They live inside all year round. The only thing I do is in the summer, I push them right up against the glass for maximum light, but the angle of the sun is so high that the sun doesn't come in through those windows. So they never get direct sun, except when I miss the mark. And as you can see here, this is my little bilatulum. This is when I was distracted and I missed the mark, not just one day, several days. I'm sure one day wouldn't have been a big deal, but several days, the angle of the sun reached this orchid down where it was living and I didn't pick up on that until it was far too late. So these guys, bright, bright light, and just for 100% security, no direct sun. As long as they have bright light, they will perform. They don't need full sun or any kind of sun coming onto their leaves in order to make it happen for them. So I've got a new leaf growing in there, but you know what? For the time being, it's not bothering me. I've got the time to take care of it, but I believe this one is a goner. These guys aren't robust when they're species as they are when they are like hybrids and all the fussiness has been bred out of them. When it comes to flushing, I've always been rigorous, always. My principle has always been fill up to the top until you see the water all the way to the top and then let it drain out and repeat. You know, like the mask size twice into the inner pot. Let it drain out, repeat, fill the mask reservoir, put it away. I have noticed that with foliage, there's a big difference and I've lost two paths this year. The finer foliage ones, and this one is not as fine as the other one. You know, the fine ones with the almost translucent leaf and the other, like the spring green mottling? They're ape, the apex at the leaf joints down by the media where they always say, keep the path a little bit lower in the media than 
necessary than we would do with other orchids because that's where the roots grow and you don't want them to die and be exposed in the air. That apex is fundamentally important to somehow maintain dry. So these guys here, this one, the Lindy Kupowitz in this foliage is a little bit more robust and stiff and can handle, repels water a little bit better if, for example, I flush and the water gets up to here. I do not do that anymore because I've learned my lesson with the more delicate paths that I lost earlier this year. There is, the minute you get water, and this was during the summer months, mine, the minute you get water into the apex and it doesn't dry off, that'll cause the rot from inside. And funny enough, that even happened with my dry top layer. So I have become very conservative about how I flush. The point is not to, you know, let the water le level rise to the top and then go all the way down. The point is to aerate the roots, never mind whether I get the water level to rise and lower, just aerate the roots, you know, two masks, aerate and move on, let it go. Because I always thought with my dry top layer there would not be a problem, but clearly with the more delicate leaved paths, it is very, very important that the top or the apex in there is maintained with as little as water in the leaf joint as possible. So very conservative flushing with all my slipper orchids. And that is what I learned this summer after having lost the delicate ones, because I was asking myself, why did I lose two paths? Never mind the sun one. And everybody else is doing great. What's that all about? And then I recognized it was the two with the most delicate foliage. Here's my Paphiopedlum Iona. Same thing as well. The foliage is very, very delicate. It feels sturdy, but the leaf apex is so tight. And this one is so vigorous that it, you know, creates multiple fans over and over, even prior to having anything die back. So this is danger city for flushing and doing, being a little bit too aggressive with the water. This is not good at all. And I am very concerned, for example, about my flower spikes here, especially because I have not been fertilizing as much as prior. So I'm wondering if I'm even gonna get long flower spikes the way I did last year up to here. Because last year I was like, I used to leave fertilized water in the reservoir. And then I saw leaf burn coming. This is sun damage, but I saw leaf tip die back on some of my older leaves that have now died off, there was like a burn just like on the Phragmopedium. And that is fertilizer burn, leaf tips. So I've been very hesitant with being so aggressive regarding my fertilizing and keeping fertilized water in the deposit. Will it affect how the flower spikes grow? Will they be stunted when the bud opens? We shall see. But that is the learning curve, and that's why I said in the beginning, I'm flattered you wanted to know how I care for mine, because, well, oops, it's still a learning curve. And I can only tell you what I've noticed and recognized in the past two years about these guys. For the time being, I have them under my blurple lights, and these are really, like, sh short. So if the blurple lights are somewhat, you know, up here, kind of like a height, but they are right underneath the purple lights. They are not away from the line of fire. And I have them all lined up on the bottom row, as you saw in the video of my dining room tour. So light levels, for me, I am astounded. I never thought they needed much light at all. And I think I was proven wrong. Direct sunlight is a definite no-no, but a lot of bright shade is absolutely a yes. And for flowering, possibly a must. So maybe if you put your American hybrid <clears throat> a little bit more into a more lit up area, I don't know how or where it's standing. And so forgive me for that, but I'm saying maybe it is only a light issue because it sounds really, really healthy from what you told me in the comment. So basically these two actually 
live together, basically on the shelf like that. This one in front of this one behind it. And they get bright light as long as there is light. And now with the days getting darker earlier, they get the residual light of the blurple lights. But that's fine because they've had good light all day long. So the last two hours, it's not that big a deal. Whereas the other ones are now also in that blurple light. So I think, oh yeah, temperature. Let me just define the temperature. Um, it's, it, it's my general temperature, for example, in winter indoors, because these don't go outside, minus the frag. My indoor temperatures go as low as 16 degrees Celsius because I don't use a heater and I do not use a humidifier. If I want to take the chill out of the air of my dining room, just there's sort of a chill in the air when it gets really cold, it'll be 16 degrees with a nip in the air. I will put up uh, candles. <laughs> I will. Yes, I shall I have a centerpiece for a dining table that I put big candles on. And then I light the candles for my orchids and that takes the bite out of the air. But I don't use a heater or a temperature regulator. So minimum is 16 degrees. And then of course in the summer, the maximum can be whatever it is. I mean, I've had it, I've had hot winds blow in up to 40 degrees, very, very rarely and not, you know, over weeks extended but it can get pretty, pretty hot. But at that point, the only humidity, extra humidity they get are the humidity trays in that area where they're stood. I don't do more than that. And outside for my Phragmopedium, just as a little add-on, I know that this may not have been the question, but I can go as low as five degrees Celsius. And then in the corner where it lives in the summer in perma shade, it can be like 30, 32 degrees. And all I do with that one is just keep pouring fresh water through it when it's not raining. And twice a week? Yeah, about twice a week. And I don't care winter or summer when it comes to this Phragmopedium. I just have my bucket, whatever I've got left over. And before I refresh the bucket and make a new, just plain RO water bucket, it always gets the remainder of what's in the bucket. So it can happen three times a week, twice a week. And then, and then even when it rains, I let it rain on it. So it's like a constant cycle of water and water. So we've got the temperatures light. I did the fertilizing. I would say very, very carefully flush. If there is a danger in this setup, in my opinion, very, very careful flushing technique. Pour around the orchid. Do not let the water level rise. I don't know how you flush your other orchids, but I'm normally like the one, you know, water level all the way to the top and let it drain. And then, and then the second load goes in while the first load is still draining through. So I'm pretty radical when it comes to flushing. I have not done that with these guys since I lost the other two more delicate ones. I just don't want to risk losing more. Silly things like sun, that happens. Oh well, move on, you know, live and learn. But the flushing is the same thing. That's my biggest factor when it comes to how can I kill a slipper orchid in semi-hydro. And that is for me the flushing technique. I think I've covered everything. If not, woohoo, we have the comments down below. More questions are very, very welcome. And I can't believe I just spoke 25 or 26 minutes on the subject of slipper orchids when two years ago I was absolutely clueless. But hey, doesn't mean I'm totally clueless now, doesn't mean I know everything by now, but I just gave you a rundown of what I have found out, figured out, and how I am trying now to balance things out in order not to get my slipper orchids looking like this. Seeing as they're slow growers, <laughs> that's going to take a long time to make the leaves look nice. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that helps. That uh, kind of maybe answers a question or resonates with you or supports a thought, supported a doubt that you had, anything like that. That you maybe you thought you were doing it wrong and here I am yapping away and you're going, ah, oh, I'm doing that too. All right. So either way, I hope that this was useful and of some help. I really appreciate everybody who's watched this video. Thank you so very, very much. 
Have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.